I'm okay. I think I'm okay. Yes. My notes. So far away. <laughs> Welcome to a fireside chat with our newly confirmed Supreme Court Justice Tamika Montgomery Reeves. Before we start, I'd like to do some acknowledgments. We have had funding support today from the Cultural Programming Fund for the university, as well as administrative support from the College of Education, Humanities, and Social Sciences, with a special shout out to Zach Kimball, who is making sure this event is live stream. Zach, can you wave your hand? I know you're somewhere around. Okay, great. Okay. So the question could come up, what is a fireside chat? So fireside chats were initially started by President Franklin D. Roosevelt, and this was in 1933, between the years of 1933 and 1944, before most of us in this room were born. <laughs> the term fireside chat was inspired by his press secretary, who said that the president liked to think of the audience as a few people seated around his fireside. Now these fireside chats were held as a radio broadcast. So fast forward, several years, and we're doing it today as a different type of presentation, something that would actually give you the opportunity to hear someone's stories. So I'm going to introduce to you the participants. The first is our moderator, Dr. Tony Allen. Dr. Allen became the 12th president on January the 1st, 2020. He previously served as Delaware State University's executive vice president and provost. During his two and a half year tenure as chief academic officer, Tony implemented a reorganization of the university's academic colleges and the professional advising unit. Under his leadership, the university has developed new impact-oriented organizations, such as the Center for Neighborhood Revitalization and Research and the Center for Global Africa. During that period, the university's funded research portfolio increased from 19 million to 23 million. He has labored tirelessly to raise public awareness and build or expand partnerships for Delaware State University in the public and private sector. He has developed relationships with the City of Wilmington, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, J.P. Morgan Chase, Cordova, Exelon, Apple, and many, many others. He is a public servant, he is a giver, he's a rapper, <laughs> You're not supposed to Please say that. notice my expression. I've heard him rap and it's like, not all that, brother, but okay. First of all, it's strong. I could, I'll spit a hot 16 right now. Just saying. All right. As a first generation college student himself, he has a very unique understanding and passion for everyone having access to the opportunities that education can provide. Next, I turn to Tamika Montgomery Reeves. She's our most recently confirmed Associate Justice on the Delaware Supreme Court. She was nominated by Governor John Carney in October 2019 and unanimously confirmed by the Delaware State Senate in November of 2019. By virtue of her investiture in January of this year, she became the first African American to serve on the state Supreme Court. Prior 
Prior to this appointment, Justice Montgomery Reeves served as Vice Chancellor on the Delaware Court of Chancery. She was the first African American and only the second woman to serve on this Delaware Court. Prior to her appointment to the court, Montgomery Reeves was a partner at Wilson, Sansini, Goodrich, and Rosati, where she focused on corporate governance, navigation of corporate fiduciary duties, and corporate litigation. She also practiced in the Securities and Corporate Governance Department of Wheel, Gottschall, and Mange, and served as a judicial clerk to then Chancellor William B. Chandler on the Delaware Code of Chancery. She serves as a member of the Delaware Community Foundation Board, and she has served as a member of the Mother Teresa House Board of Directors, and has served as a subcommittee member of the Delaware Access to Justice Commission. She received recognition for her pro bono work to, as her contribution to the Prisoner's Rights Project. She graduated with her bachelor's degree, magna cum laude, not thank you, Laudy, from the University of Mississippi. <laughs> I'm so I know. I'm feeling you. I was on the same page. I still feel it. I know. Same here. Same here. And her law degree from the University of Georgia Law School. I'm going to turn it over to Tony in just one minute, but I just want to give you a little bit about the protocol today. They're going, he has a set of questions that he's going to ask her, but there's also opportunity for questions from the audience. There are index cards available from some of the students who are standing around. If you have a question that you want asked, just raise your hand, someone will bring you a card, and the cards will be delivered to Tony. And then we will take it from there. But at this point, I turn it over to Dr. Allen. Thank you, Dean Horton. How's everybody doing? So I, I don't know that you uh, felt the impact of Dean Horton's words. Uh, Justice Tamika Montgomery Reeves is the first African American on the Delaware Supreme Court. Think about that for a minute. What you may not know uh, is Delaware was central in the, how many people know Brown versus Board of Education? Delaware was a central uh, place in the Brown versus Board of Education. In fact, it was among the cases that went to the United States Supreme Court, and it was the only case where the uh, judge ruled in, in favor of the plaintiff setting the precedent for Brown. 1954. In 2020, we just got our first black Supreme Court justice for Delaware. Not only that, she's also, I believe, the youngest in the history of the Delaware Supreme Court. Is that right? That's right. That is a special, special responsibility. Let's give it up for that as well. And I'm pleased to say uh, my first order of business, day two on the job, was to reach out uh, to uh, Justice Montgomery Reeves and ask her to be our commencement speaker for spring 2020. She cannot do that, had a conflict. But she is going to be our winter commencement speaker. So thank you for doing that. We are really, really pleased to have you here, Your Honor, and want to just spend some time talking and getting to know uh, who you are. How many students in the room? So students, pay particular attention because the path is not always straight. And I think you'll hear from her story where she comes from, what her experiences are, and what it took to her for her to get here at this particular moment in time. So Your Honor, first question, tell us your story. All right, so let me start. I have to always start any speech that I give with a disclaimer. Anything that I say today and the views that I express are my own uh, and are not those of my colleagues or the Supreme Court. So the question is, how did I get here? What my story is, right? So I'm from Jackson, Mississippi, uh, born and raised down south. Uh, my parents, I'm one of three children from my, my parents' marriage. Uh, they had me very young. Uh, neither of my parents had graduated from college when they had me and my two sisters. And so, um, you know, early on, my, my childhood was a little bit of a struggle. 
Uh, but I watched my parents go back to school. Mm -hmm. I was old enough, you know, to remember my mom going back to nursing school, actually. I remember uh, riding in the car. She worked overnight. She would drop us off at school and then go to nursing school in the daytime. I remember holding her nursing books. And when she graduated, my dad did the same. Wow. I tell you that story to tell you about the importance of education to me. Uh, I, they taught me that education is the key to everything. Nobody ever told me if I could sing well, I would... You know, that would be the answer. No one ever told me if I could, you know, if I was a great athlete, that would be the answer. My, my parents always instilled in me the importance of education. And they didn't just say it to me. I was able to see it and see the difference in our lives before they graduated from college and afterwards. So the first, you know, data point is the importance of education uh -huh. and actually seeing that. Yep. Uh, and the next one is probably how did I end up focusing on the law? My grandmother. Um, wow. My grandmother could not read or write. She uh, did not graduate from, from high school. She told me that her education stopped in second grade. Um, but she knew the importance of the law. She used to tell me stories about people in Mississippi who, according to her, didn't know their rights, you know, faced uh, criminal charges, may have uh, pled guilty to crimes that had consequences that they didn't understand. And she always talked about how important it is to know your rights how important it is to help people when you know your rights. And she is the one who actually directed me toward the law. So I decided, believe it or not, in the second or third grade, that I oh, wanted wow. to be a lawyer. Wow. Um, and uh, pretty much stuck to that all the way uh, to now. So that's how I ended up focusing on the law. So how did I end up in Delaware, from Mississippi to Delaware? Well, I went to law school in Georgia. Uh, and I went to law school thinking that my initial focus was going to be on criminal law. While I was there, I met a very nice law professor who came up to me and told me, he was on the admissions committee, uh, committee and told me, I read your essay uh, to get into law school. I thought it was amazing and I wanted to come and introduce myself. And I was like, what does that guy teach? Uh, and the answer was corporate law, and <laughs> uh -huh. so I took it. Uh -huh. I did not have a background in corporate law before that. My parents couldn't tell you anything about corporate law, at least not at that point in my life. Um, but it was one of the most difficult classes I'd ever taken. And so what I decided is that that class was not going to beat me. So I focused in on it, and I learned it, and I developed a real passion for it. I really enjoyed corporate law. And I'm sure a lot of you in the room know this. Delaware is the heart of corporate law for the entire country. Uh, right in Georgia, I was studying Delaware corporate law. I didn't study any about mm. Georgia corporate law. I studied Delaware corporate law. Uh, and, and really enjoyed it. And my professor uh, encouraged me to apply for a clerkship. In the legal community, that's something like an internship, and I would commend any of you who have the opportunity to do an internship. If you have the opportunity to do it in something you think you're interested in, absolutely do that. It is, will never be a waste of your time. You will learn something one way or the other. Well, I did that, and I clerked here in the Court of Chancery for then Chancellor uh, William Chandler. And mm -hmm. discovered that I absolutely loved uh, Delaware Corporate Law. I left there and went to New York. I uh, lived in Manhattan and practiced that law for a few years, uh, and then decided to come back to Delaware to work with my mentor, uh, Chancellor Chandler, again at the law firm of Wilson Sunsea. So that's that's how I ended up in Delaware. And uh, what's what's your experience been like as a lawyer, as a Delaware resident? What's what's it been like for you? I feel absolutely uh, blessed. I have been. I've had nothing but positive experiences since been here, since I've since I've come here. Extremely well received. Um, I've been able to. So I already had my uh, mentor, uh, Chancellor Chandler, uh, from Delaware, and I met other people in connection with my um, my time in, uh, clerking in Delaware. But since coming back, I've been able to really uh, create a family here. I have a wonderful church home. I have friends who I. Uh, enjoy spending time with, and I've had nothing but positive experiences and a lot of very warm, uh, supportive people around me and beside me since coming to Delaware. And you have two kids and a wonderful husband, I'm That's told. That's right. I have yeah. an amazing husband sitting right over here. Stand husband, up. stand up. And I heard it was a long night last night, too, for last the nine-month-old. That's right, the night before, too. Um, <laughs> I have a Well, you know, um, many of our students from, come from lots of different backgrounds, as you might imagine. 
and overcome significant challenges uh, as they come here and on to subsequent life. Tell us about a significant challenge in your life and how you might have overcome it. Significant challenge in how I might have overcome it. Well, I guess there are a few. Um, and, and, I, and I think the, the answer to that sort of just depends on how you, how you approach things, right? So I'll give you a few examples. Mm -hmm. um, my first example is my sort of uh, thought that um, a no is not always a no, sometimes it's a yes. When you're in law school, uh, one of the first things that you're taught your first year of law school is the thing that you want to do is to go out and to join a big law firm. Um, and I went to law school in Georgia, so the natural place to go is big law firms in Atlanta. And there were two huge law firms in Atlanta that I was very interested in. I applied to both of them as well as probably 40 other law firms. But I did not, I did not get uh, an interview with the top two law firms. Uh, and that was very disappointing. Uh, but I just buckled down and got into better grades and said, you know what, this is, I'm going to use this as a, as a moment. I'm going to use this as a chance to really think about my opportunities and think about what's out there and think about what I should be focused on. That no forced me to open, to broaden my horizon and to open myself up to other opportunities. That other opportunity that presented itself was the clerkship. Had it not been for not getting into those law, two law firms, I probably wouldn't be sitting in front of you because I would have gone there and I wouldn't apply for clerkship. Uh, so that's a situation where I would say a challenge or a no uh, it's not always a no. Sometimes it's, it's a yes. Sometimes it's, there's something different. Uh, and I take whatever challenge is in front of me and I try to, uh, if it's something I need to overcome, work hard to overcome it. If it's something that's a no or something that I don't succeed at, then trying to make sure that I learn from whatever I just dealt with. Did you always want to be a judge? No, I did not always want to be a judge. I knew that I wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, and Probably early on, I thought, man, being a judge would be a dream job, particularly when I clerked and I was able to, to watch uh, the judge that I worked with. Uh, just, uh, you know, he was so impressive uh, academically, writing these, those opinions that he was writing, but also the way that he treated people. I certainly looked at that and thought that would be an absolutely <laughs> amazing uh, career. I knew then, though, that it was, uh, you know, it takes a lot to get there and lightning, so it has to strike at two or three different places um, in order for that to happen, so I didn't have any expectation of it. But Tell us a little bit about the judicial, becoming a judge. How, how does that happen? In Delaware. So, Delaware, there are states where you run to become a judge, and you, uh, just like the election that we're getting this race, see the presidential election, you have judges to run for president. Uh, that is not the case in Delaware. In Delaware, uh, for the most part, you need to be a lawyer, and, and once you are an attorney, you get notifications of vacancies, judicial vacancies. There's an application process. There are requirements, like you have to have been a lawyer for X number of years, uh, depending on what court you are in, you have to live in X county. Um, but there's an application process, and that application uh, is a, I forget how many pages application, it has a writing component. Uh, so you fill out an application. Once you do that, uh, two or three different groups look at your application and they discuss uh, who you are in the community, what you've been doing, what your reputation is. You do an interview process with a group called the Judicial Nominating Commission. Once you go through that process, uh, that group narrows the list of candidates that they send to the governor, typically to three, sometimes four, but typically three uh, candidates. Those three candidates after um, uh, they, do the interview, they do an interview, so let me take a step back. The Judicial Nominating Commission is made up of lay people and lawyers. Okay. Uh, and so you go in and you go in for a pretty long interview with them, they send names to the governor, you do an interview with the governor, and the governor selects his nominee. Uh, once the governor selects a the nominee, then there is a Senate confirmation process, essentially. Uh, and you go through that process and then you're confirmed. And, and, that, and there are a couple of things I would say that you should think about and take from that. Um, from, from just that process. Uh, one is the importance of your reputation. Yeah. You know, um, I filled out that application, and everyone else filled out that application, and all sorts of people who I know and don't know um, had some say in whether or not I would sit here before you. Uh, the Judicial Nominating Commission contacted all of the lawyers that I said, oh, here are people that I worked with. Uh, both uh, 
uh, people who work directly with me and people who I was on the other side from. So if you're in litigation, you're on the other side with someone. It's a it's a adversarial and sometimes contentious relationship. You might imagine that you um, uh, are not don't have just the right temperament. The other side, you know, may not have great things to say about you. Um, so it you know teaches you the importance of of, of how you treat people. Uh, another group of people that they contacted were not just like the people that I put on the list as my recommenders. Mm -hmm. They contacted my assistant. They contacted my former assistants. They contacted my um, law clerks. Was that unbeknownst to you? Did you did you know they were contacting folks? Yeah, I knew they were uh -huh. doing it. Mm -hmm. But of course, when I was uh, when I was working in these places initially, I didn't know that I was going to be applying for this right. one day. Right. Um, and so uh, I say that to say the important. You know, to, to highlight the importance of always remembering it. And it's my philosophy that everybody has something to add, right? We all have something to learn, and everybody that you run into has something to add. Um, and you have to be careful how you treat people. You just should anyway because it's the right thing to do, but also you never know where life is going to take mm -hmm. you, who you're mm -hmm. going to need, or how you're going to need them, mm -hmm. or how people may be able to help you or not. And so you should always, always treat people just the way you would want to be treated, or you would want your favorite person to be treated. That sounds like lessons from those parents and that grandmother, I Absolutely. imagine. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so you're in, let's back up a little bit, you're in a corporate law firm, uh, and you've worked for this incredible mentor who had, had been a judge. When did, you, when did you decide, and why did you decide, I want to become a judge? So um, I have always known that I wanted to give back uh -huh. um, I've always been uh, public service oriented, but my career, at least until that point, had been focused on corporate law, and that's where my expertise was. Uh, and so I was, you know, trying to figure out how am I going to be able to do this? How can I use corporate law? Uh, how can that help me to give back in some way? And uh, the Court of Chancery, as I was saying, Delaware is well known for its corporate law. Uh, the Court of Chancery in Delaware is the corporate court. That's where those disputes tend to, to come. Uh, and one of the judges there retired. Mm -hmm. uh, and I talked to my mentor at that point and just thought, this is the perfect way for me to use my expertise today to give back, uh, to be able to go on to the court that sparked my interest in all of this, uh, and to be able to take the years of experience that I've had in private practice and to go uh, to that court. And so that's what uh, made me decide to go ahead and apply. I also thought, you know, I'm the kind of person who, you know, you have some people who, uh, they walk in the room and they hear the, I don't know if you see Muhammad Ali, but there's a scene where a drum plays and he says, the champ is here. I'm not that person. I don't hear that at all. I'm a theme song when I walk in. <laughs> I'm always like, oh, I'm never going to get this. Um, so, you know, I apply for that thing. I would love to do it, but the chances are, are unlikely. But the thing that made me go ahead and do the application was I felt like I would regret it. Like, I just needed to mm -hmm. put my name in the hat. If I didn't put my name in the hat, there's no way it would happen. Um, so I needed to put my name in the hat, and if I didn't, I would always regret that. And you did, and you got the judgeship on the first try, right? Yes, that's correct. Well, that's Let fantastic. me add something there uh, that's important, I think, uh, which is putting your name in the hat. Even if you're afraid, if there's something that you think you want to do, you definitely won't do it if you don't try. That that's absolutely true. And if you try, it really might happen. You know, thinking about, for example, these uh, this. Um, judicial process, the, 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 the nominees and the, the judicial officers are selected from the pot of people who apply. And if you don't put your name out there, then, then as I just said, right. you, you, do, you really don't have a shot. And so if there's something that you think you're interested in, if there's something that you think you want to do, step out. Step out of faith, whatever you step out on, and believe in yourself and give it a go, give it a try. So Your Honor, that's a fantastic, that's fantastic. I wonder, um, as a uh, woman and uh, a person of color, particularly during your law career, uh, did you ever feel uh, that you had to be better than everybody else? Or how did you approach that in a world that I imagine was filled with a look more homogenous, more white, more male? How did you, how did you deal with that? So I don't know if I necessarily felt that from that world uh -huh. as opposed to just all my life, like all along. Mm -hmm. you know, I was always told by my parents, right? So I, I can't even pinpoint uh, some thing that happened to me, but just told by my parents that I needed to 
do better, be better, work harder. Uh, and they didn't necessarily tie it to my, believe it or not, they didn't tie it to my race or gender. They just told me I had to. I'll give you an example. Growing up, I remember bringing report cards home. And you know, you, you would get, let's say, six grades. And I may have five A's and one B. And my mom never looked at me and said, this is a great job. She would say, you got five A's. That's that means that you have got six. Like you just used to work a little harder, you have to push a little more. That must have been a fun household. It was. Um, but so I, I just was always pushed. You know, that's that's how my parents raised me. Uh -huh. Pushed, frankly, to, against myself, you know, uh, to just be the best, to do uh, the most, and to work as hard as I could. Um, and so I, that's just who I am. It's just been how I, you know, it's how I was raised, it's how I was taught, and I was that kid in kindergarten, and it's just followed me all the way until now. That's fantastic. And, and when you think about, I'm sure you mentor a lot of folks too, uh, what, do you, what do you impart to them relative to how they should prepare themselves for the world? So I tell them a lot of the things that I've been telling you about the importance of being good people, because I, I really do think that that's very important. Um, another thing that I often tell them is to uh, take ownership of whatever you do. Uh, for me, say if you're in a law firm, you get some research project. Uh, taking ownership of whatever thing you have, so research project, making yourself the expert in it, making yourself the best you can in it. There may be some partner, some person who you know, is over everything. There may be some person who uh, puts all the pieces together, but making sure that you make yourself invaluable to that person. Uh, and I think that one way you do that is to, to take ownership of everything that you do. I also always tell people to be open to opportunity. You just never know uh, how it's going to come. You may have I had every expectation that I would be in Atlanta at one of the big firms as a partner. Uh, and luckily, you know, that did not work out. <laughs> and I was open to opportunity. Uh, and I am down what I think is a much better path, uh, mm -hmm. certainly for me. So I think it's so important to be open to opportunity. The other piece of advice that I give um, to young people is knowing the importance of your reputation. And I said this before, and that you have control over it. I mention it again because you're growing up in a social media era, right? I mean, when I was in high school, there was no Facebook came along when I was in law school. So there, there was no Facebook. There wasn't, you know, the, the social media presence just wasn't there. Unfortunately, you know, your decisions and mistakes, particularly if you're on social media, don't just happen with the people around you. Like, they're posted for the world to see. And so I think you have to be... Uh, more cognizant and very aware that you're building your reputation right now. Are you on social media? No. <laughs> I was for a little while. Uh -huh. I was for a little while. Um, I was very careful even then, though. Uh -huh. But what I realized is that I didn't even like some of the things that I was being associated with. So, mm -hmm. you know, let's say a cousin is my friend and a cousin posts something crazy. You know, I, did, I just didn't like that. So. Oh, your favorite uncle at Thanksgiving. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so I, I got off. I'm not on any social media now. So I, I want to talk a little bit about what a typical day for a Delaware Supreme Court justice looks like. Walk us through what that might look like in a day. So um, it depends on the day. If it's a Wednesday, then I'm probably right here in Dover, right down the street, listening to arguments. Uh, and those arguments touch on all sorts of areas of the law, very important areas of the law. Uh, I might be dealing with something like uh, a parent losing their parental rights, um, or you know, a prisoner who thinks that uh, he or she had ineffective assistance of counsel. There was some wonderful defense that should have been raised and wasn't raised, and now that person is in prison, and uh, whether or not uh, uh, um, uh, they, they had effective counsel. Um, I might be dealing with a corporate law issue. As I, as I uh, told you earlier, uh, Delaware uh, has more Fortune 500 com companies incorporated here uh, than any other state. It has more corporate citizens than real human citizens. Uh, as a result, Delaware corporate law leads the way in corporate law, and many states look to our corporate law. So I may be addressing some uh, cutting edge corporate law issue that I know other states are going to look to. Uh, so you know, on Wednesdays, I'm sitting in arguments, and there are lawyers in front of us arguing the particular issues. And so it's not just you, it's your, the, the entire it's, Supreme Court bench? That's correct. Uh -huh. So you could have a panel of three Supreme Court justices, or you have what's called en banc, which is all the Supreme Court justices. And the lawyers come in, they argue 
argue their positions to us. We go back, we deliberate, and then we come up with the answer. Now, what you may or may not realize, and this is, has been true for me my entire career, both as uh, an attorney, then as a trial judge, and now as an appellate uh, judge, the vast majority of my time is not spent in court. It is spent writing. researching, writing, mm -hmm. digging deep, learning, uh, becoming expert, like I told you all, in whatever is in front of me at that time. So most days I am reading. I have my head in a, in a book or paper or on a screen and I'm reading and writing and, and digging into a record or a case law or statutory law. Anybody out there want to be in the legal profession? A lot of you. So, Your Honor, what, what, what uh, would you tell them are the two or three key skills they must master as they think about law school? Um, I think, as you think about law school, research, writing are so key. No matter what area of the law you want to go into, when you go to law school, you're going to have to research, you're going to have to write. Every test will be a, an essay test or you'll have a paper class. I would say those are the two things that I would focus on, particularly honing your writing skills. Those are going to be very, very important uh, in law school. Talk to us about why the writing is so important. I mean, for, well, because that's how you advocate. There are certain areas of, of the profession where you do more oral advocacy, but for the most part, especially talking about litigation, let's focus on that. That's how you advocate. You don't just, for the most part, wake up and walk into court. You have to file a paper to get into court. You have to write something to even walk through the door. Uh, and if one side writes something, the other side gets to write something in response. So, so much of the law and is written, right? So much of your positions, that's how you start. You will write things. Uh, and and, and that's, that's why, at least in my view, uh, it's so important um, and why I would focus on that as the number one thing. There are other skills that you will need to develop, critical thinking and uh, the, ability to, the ability to hear and understand two sides of a story and the ability, to, frankly, to argue against yourself um, uh, when you're talking about sides uh, of an argument. But I think those are skills that law school does a really good job developing once you get there. Tell us a little bit about, because I've heard this from my, my lawyer friends too, what do you mean by argue against yourself and why is that so important in the legal profession? Well, particularly in what, I wanted, in what I'm doing now, mm -hmm. what I did as a law clerk and what I did as a judge, the, what you want to do is get to the right answer, as, as a judge at least. Um, and so you have to be able to see both sides of an argument. Uh, you have to be able to look at, for example, a statute and, and be able to you know, say, okay, here's what the statute says. I can see that there's an argument that you know, the um, litigant is entitled to uh, notice. The litigant is entitled to notice based on this particular uh, language. But I can also see that there's this language on the other side of the, the table that suggests that the litigant is not entitled to notice. So the reason why you want to be able to do that, frankly, as a lawyer, is to anticipate the, what the other side is going to do and to present a stronger argument. And then the reason why you want to be able to do that as a jurist, frankly, is to get to the right answer. What is the right answer? Where should I, our law go? Mm -hmm. And you have to understand both sides in order to do that. So this might be a harder question. It may go to your judicial philosophy a little bit, but can you give us a time when you really were struggling with the case and was impactful to you? and how you sort of, how you're thinking as to how you resolve it. And that happens to me every single week. <laughs> um, I'm one of these people who just internalizes everything and I take every case and, and struggle with it, right? I, I look at it from the perspective of, let's say if it's a criminal case, the victim and wanting to make sure that there's justice from the victim, for the victim. I look at it from the perspective of the defendant and wanting to make sure that our system uh, is fair uh, and that people have access to justice and that it's a system that is, is getting to the right result. Uh, I look at it from the perspective of just wanting to make sure that our law uh, is uh, the best that it can be and it's, it's the right thing. So I don't have a single uh, case that's the most impactful because I have so many. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I have uh, cases uh, that I heard today that I am absolutely like, you know, I can totally see this answer from just an equitable what should the answer be perspective, but I can absolutely see why our legislature might have written a law that says you know, something slightly different and why from a broader perspective, you know, this makes sense uh, from, a, from a policy perspective. So I don't have a single one. I do that on pretty, 
much everything. And it's part of who I am, but I also think it's an important thing to do, right? These cases that are in front of us are important to the people who are in front of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and I try to put myself in their position in every single one of them. So I'm gonna turn the page before we open up for questions. Uh, what non-legal thing that is completely fun do you like to do when you can do it? And if you could do it all the time, what would that thing be? Completely fun. So. Not, not rapping, because that's what I do. I've got to. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently you're really good. And apparently. <laughs> I've got to really take myself back four and a half years. I love to travel. I absolutely love to travel. Uh, it's something my husband and I have in common. We, I used to think that it wasn't a vacation if you didn't need shots to go. Uh, <laughs> so I'm a little afraid of that now that I have kids, but I absolutely love to travel. If I wasn't working and I didn't have to do anything else, I would hop on a plane and literally bounce all across the, the world and just soak up and absorb different experiences and different people's cultures. What are your favorite three places in the world? My favorite three places that I have been to uh, would be uh, South Africa. I love South Africa. I've been to. I love Zimbabwe and Zambia. Mm -hmm. I loved Egypt. So those are probably my favorite places. There's so far. a theme there. There were some pretty amazing uh, trips. Uh -huh. Some pretty amazing trips. But I've been a, a number of fun places. It's all on hold now. But once these kids are old enough to stay some with somebody else, I'm going to pick it back up. <laughs> yeah, I get, get that. You want to babysit? I got. Four. You want to babysit mine? Do I want to babysit yours or yeah. can yours babysit mine? No, no, no. no. Your way. Yeah, no. no. Okay. I'm okay That's with fine. the two. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, questions from the audience. I think uh, Dean Horton's going to help me moderate that section. While we uh, field those questions, I do want to pay tribute to the uh, Lovely ladies of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, <laughs> who I believe are celebrating their 100th year. That's right. Is that right? I forgot to wear my blue. I apologize. I apologize. So you talked a little bit about um, your grandmother uh, very passionately. Who else, who else really inspires you? Um, so, you know, it sort of depends on, on what, what, what you're looking for, right? I, I absolutely have legal giants who have inspired me, right? Um, uh, Thurgood Marshall, mm -hmm. right? How can you be a jurist? <laughs> especially an African-American jurist and not be inspired by Thurgood Marshall, or a uh, RBG, the notorious RBG, and all of her fights for, uh, <laughs> fight for women right. issues. Right. I actually That's had right. the privilege of interviewing her in a oh, fireside right. chat a couple That's years great. ago. Yeah. That's great. Um, it, when you're talking about Delaware, Lewis Redding, uh, who was uh, the first African-American admitted to the Delaware Bar in 1929, absolute inspiration, um, and was brave enough to to want to be a lawyer during that time. Uh, Paulette Sullivan Moore, who was the first African-American um, lawyer here, Josh Martin and mm -hmm. uh, Haley mm -hmm. Alford. But uh, the true answer is my day-to-day -day heroes, right? I would not be here but for um, seeing my parents and watching them, now that I'm a parent, really understanding the work that it took to go back to school with mm -hmm. three young children. We were probably the ages of six, four, and two when my mother went back to school, uh, and not much older when my father went back wow. to school. And then when I went to college, my dad went and got his bachelor's degree at the same time. And when I went to law school, he went and got his master's degree at the same time. So really, you know, having those heroes right at home with yeah, me, mm -hmm. pushing me at the same time that they were pushing themselves, uh, those, my mom and my dad are probably my greatest shiro and hero. And hero, great. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so first question from the audience. How do you separate out your personal beliefs from the law? For example, you may not believe in abortion, but a case is presented to the Supreme Court where the evidence upholds the law. Uh, so I'm a firm believer in the importance of the law. Um, and I think law school actually helps you with that, too, really pushes you uh, toward understanding, like, 
you may be, you may completely disagree with the law for whatever personal reasons, religious reasons that you have, but you're representing, you are um, uh, deciding, addressing something that is not yours personally. It is a, a, a much broader thing. Um, and so I, I, I don't know where I developed the skill or when I developed it, but I am absolutely able to just push aside what I personally believe and really focus on what is the right answer under the law uh, for all of us. And you know what part of that is, honestly? I wouldn't want somebody imposing their own personal beliefs mm -hmm. on me. Mm -hmm. And so I often think about that. Like even if I disagree with something from a personal perspective, the person sitting next to me may have some uh, perspective on it that I wouldn't want imposed upon me. And so that makes it a little easier to remove myself, if you will. So a corollary to that, I guess you, uh, is there a lead justice on the Supreme Court by case that writes kind of the lead opinion? Is that how that works? Yes, so there is the chief justice of the court. Mm -hmm. And the way that it works is that uh, either the chief justice or, or the most senior justice on a panel decides who writes the opinion. Uh, and then one justice takes the lead in writing the opinion. But because the opinion comes from the panel or the whole court, everyone is able to uh, comment, edit, put their thoughts on the opinion, which makes for a much better process because you do have people who catch issues that you may not catch, who check, uh, you know, um, check opinions to make sure that you're not expanding things further than you have to, or to make sure that you're addressing issues that you need to. So that's sort of the way that process works. Sure. This is a long one, uh, and the handwriting looks like mine, so give me a minute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Politics aside, the, su the uh, supremacy clause sets the hierarchy for the importance of laws. Since we have extensive immigration laws federally, how can states and cities declare themselves to be sanctuary cities and states in direct conflict with the federal law? Why aren't these conflicts preempted? I cannot answer that. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And I remember her commercial at the start. Yeah. I don't, I don't that. Um, or do you expect any women's issues to come before the Delaware Supreme Court anytime soon? I haven't seen anything. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not percolating or on the horizon. Uh -huh. I'm just not aware of anything that's, that's working its way through right now. Got it. Uh, this must be from a student. How, how long would you say it took you to achieve where you are today? And, and my uh, question on, on top of that is, what's next? Um, I assume you just mean the, the amount of time uh, by how long it took me to achieve where I am today. So um, it took four years to get through undergrad, and I went straight into law school. So I spent three years in law school, a year clerking. I spent uh, four years in New York, and then four years at the law firm here, four years um, on the Court of Chancery, and so now I am uh, on the Supreme Court, and I'm 38 years old. So from graduating yeah. high school to now 20 years, 20 years. So get your weight up. Uh, and is it a is it a per, is it a lifetime appointment? It's a twelve year appointment. Twelve year appointment. Yeah, it's a twelve year appointment. Okay, okay. And there's a magistrate judge in the house and the justice of the peace in his or her third year. And what advice do you have in setting an, exam, an example on the bench? What advice do I have for a judge for mm -hmm. setting an example on the bench? Mm -hmm. um, I can just tell you how I approach things. Uh, as a, particularly as a trial judge, um, let me take a step back. As a law clerk, I remember um, working on an opinion once, and I remember Chancellor Chandler coming in um, to sit down and talk with me and my law clerk. And he talked to us about the importance of the robe. And he talked to us and he said, you know, you are working on the law and you're reading cases and you just, you know, write an answer. Uh, but it's also always important to remember that there are people in front of you, uh, that the lawyers are people in their careers, and that you know, if you're talking about a big company, there, there are people who are representing those companies in front of you. If you're talking about everyday citizens, they're everyday citizens. And to always keep that in mind, that you're dealing with mm -hmm. real people every day, day in and day out, and you should treat them accordingly. Um, 
I, you know, was taught that you should uh, be restrained as a judicial officer and focus on the issues in front of you and answer questions that you need to answer. Uh, and to not answer questions that you don't need to answer, to leave those uh, for another day. Um, uh, but to be extremely thorough uh, in your reasoning so that the court above you can understand precisely how you got to where you are. But the thing that stands out to me most about that time and my time uh, with him was really how he treated every single person who appeared in front of him. And it's certainly something that I uh, try to emulate and that I think is important to do. Next question. You're obviously successful. Delaware Supreme Court Justice, great mother and wife. How do you really juggle? Is there really work-life balance? Does that really exist? <laughs> Husband, do not answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is an interesting question. So I think particularly for people who are deciding what to do in their careers, I think you have to be realistic about what career you're thinking about going into and what it's gonna to take to do that. I think there is some balance and you have to figure out what that is, but it's gonna differ depending on what career you're in. My guess is that, I mean, maybe she does now. I'll bet you when Oprah Winfrey was in her prime, she was working a lot. Uh, and I don't know how much balance there was. Uh, if you are thinking of being a corporate lawyer, work-life balance is gonna mean something a little different. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna be a neurosurgeon, work-life balance is gonna be something a little different. So I think the first thing that you have to, to think about uh, is what career you're thinking of going into and having a realistic understanding of the expectations of that career. And then I think you have to decide who do you want to be in that career. Um, you know, do you want to be Oprah Winfrey in that career or is there something else for you? And I don't think there's a right or a wrong answer to that, but I do think you have to have a realistic assessment. Do you I, feel like you have good work-life balance? I work a lot. My husband will tell you that I work a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and my assistant is constantly telling me, you need to go home, you need to do this, you need to take time. So I probably could do better with it. Uh -huh. But what I do try to do is carve out time that is protected uh, and that I spend with my family. When I go home at night, my four and a half year old and my nine month old do not care that I am a judge. They do not care. I have to go home and watch trolls and sing songs <laughs> and bake cookies every night. Um, and I do. I carve out that time and I do that with them. And I put my son to bed unless I'm traveling for a speaking engagement or something. I put him to bed and we lay down and we sing songs and, and, uh, and read books. And I protect that, I do that every night. Every night that I'm in the same city with him, I do that, because that's very important to me. It's, it's, I work a lot, I spend most of my waking hours at work, but I try to make the hours that we have quality hours. Every Friday night, don't ask me to do anything, I'm going out with my husband, we're going out for date night, every Friday night. You can date night every Friday every night. Every Friday night. Um, so, while I Best work, date night, what's the best date night? Anything without the kids. Like, <laughs> As long as we're leaving them at home, it's the best date night ever. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, think it's, I, think, I think you have to decide, each person has to decide what's important to them. And then whatever it is that you uh, decide you need in terms of balance, I think the key is, is making sure that you protect that and making sure that it's quality time. And that, that's how I try to strike a balance. How many, I'll, I'll stop after this on work-life balance, how many hours do you do a week on average? Um, in the office or outside of the office? <laughs> How many hours Real are you lawyer. working? A week. A week. It's rare that I work less than 60 hours a week. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of weeks more, but it's rare that I work less than 60. Understood. So you've been very transparent today. Um, so sh this question, share what you'd like to share. We all have regrets. Some of us uh, might want to do over on some of those regrets. Is there any uh, regret that you really want to do over around that you'd like to share with us today? No, not that I would like to share it, but not that I, not, the answer is not that I don't want to share it. The answer is that everything that's happened in my life has led me to this point. Mm -hmm. Every single thing that's happened in my life has led me to this point. 
And so I wouldn't do any of it over. Um, what I try to do is when I have a disappointment, whether it's something that I wish I could have done better or not, I just look at it as there was something for me to learn in this. There is something greater. There's something bigger that I don't want to mess up down the line. Uh, and I needed to learn this lesson in order to prepare me for the next thing. So I can't point to a do-over because if I did it, I might not be sitting right here in front of you. So I just try to learn from each experience in my life. Any advice you would give your 21-year-old self? Uh, the, I would give my 21 self probably some advice that I would give my 38-year-old self that I don't listen to but I need to, which is um, to learn to let go of the things that I cannot control, which mm. I still struggle with, mm. but, it, but it's, I know. Uh, you said, look, the church just can. <laughs> uh, to, to learn to let go of the things that I can't control, uh, to learn to handle stress. We have so many stressors today from just, all sorts of uh, all sorts of directions, uh, and so to learn to deal with those and to and to learn to come up with things, you know, whether it's working out because that's great for your health, or whether it's talking to a therapist because you also have to take care of your mental health, or whether it's uh, talking to your spiritual advisor because that's that's your thing, or talking to your best friend, finding ways to deal with stress and not just uh, internalizing internalizing issues. So I, I would tell myself to relax a little bit. <laughs> That's what I would tell my 21-year-old self. How important is your faith to you? Extremely important. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think I would be here mm -hmm. uh, without it. Uh, once again, as important in my household as was education and all the other things I've talked about, um, my faith and was probably the most important. Um, and so it's, it's been instilled in me as a child, I mean, I'm pretty sure my mom went into labor at church. Like, we, <laughs> <laughs> we spent a lot of time in church, and it's mm -hmm. just, it's what grounds me and what keeps me, and so it's very important to me. Do you, clap for me. Do you um, feel like you have some goals, some specific goals you want to accomplish as a Delaware Supreme Court Justice? Um, no, I don't have a specific agenda. I think it's important um, to do justice, and mm -hmm. that's what I want to do. I want to make sure that justice is served, but I don't have a particular agenda that I walked in here with. I want to do a great job. Uh, I want to be a, 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 a fair justice, um, but I, I don't have an agenda. Any, uh, I, don't, I'm not, I think I asked you this question. I'm not sure if you answered it. Do you have a, something you want to do next? No, I'm focused on that. I just started this. Yeah. So, uh, Me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to do a great job at this. You know, I'm still brand new to being a justice. So I'm, I'm learning and I'm trying to get my arms around it. And, you know, I want to, I want to become great at this. Uh, and so that's, I'm sure, going to take a lot of hard work and a lot of time. So I'm working hard on that. Have you ever watched Inside the Actors Studio? You know, know that show? No, I have not. I know this, this show, but I've never watched it. So there's a guy named James Lipton, Lipton that is the uh, host, and he talks with actors. And at the end of it, he asks uh, very quick, rapid fire questions. Mind if I do that? Sure. I mean, I'm slow, so it may take me a minute to answer, but, but you can ask him as fast as you want to. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite word? It's going to be a phrase. No, Your Honor. What's your favorite word? <laughs> Goodness. Goodness. Yeah. What's your favorite sound? Music. Mm. What kind of music? Any kind of music. I love music, any kind of music. Favorite artist? At the moment, I love some Aretha Franklin. Mm. All right. <laughs> um, what uh, other profession would you choose if you couldn't be in the law? I'd probably consider the medical field. Why? Uh, just because it's another place where you can really help people. And also, everyone in my family is in the medical field. I'm the only that. person who's not doing that. So it's the most familiar thing to me. When my you germophobia get, may create some issues, but it's a whole other discussion. When you get to heaven, what would you, and you get to those pearly gates, what would you like the creator to say? Well done. My good and faithful servant.
Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in celebrating Delaware's first African-American Supreme Court justice, an exceptional person, Justice Tamika Montgomery Reeves, who will be the winner 2020 commencement speaker at Delaware State University. Thank you so much. So before we end, we have a couple of presentations. The first one will be from the illustrious Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, of which Tamika is a member. I'm calling forth Ms. Shanina Davenport Fogan, who's the Delaware State Director, to make the presentation. One second, uh, Dean Horton. Everybody, if you could just give us a couple of minutes. We'll be over in shortly. year. This is our centennial and it's so befitting that during this celebration and during Black History Month that we get to celebrate one of our own. So on behalf of the state of Delaware, all of my stores for please stand, on behalf of the state of Delaware, we want to thank you for being an inspiration. We applaud you for all of your accomplishments, being the first African American to serve on the Supreme Court and being the youngest. We thank you for being a role model to our youth auxiliaries. And we thank you for just reminding us to continue to fight, to never give up. And I was so grateful to hear you say that today, just so we can continue to push forward and to not give up on our dreams. So we applaud you and we are so proud to have you as one of our members of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. Well, thank you so much. Thank you to all of you finer women, and thank you for your service. I know you all are out there doing uh, wonderful work, and I appreciate that you're still dedicated and still doing it, and I feel honored to be a part of it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And on behalf of Delaware State University, you were amazing. <laughs> not only did you tell your story, you drew us in and gave us an opportunity not only to get to know you as a jurist, but as a person. And we really appreciate you coming here and spending this time with us. And here's a little token of our appreciation. Thank you very much, Dr. Horton. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for organizing everything and all your hard work and making this come together. I appreciate it. So thank you all for coming. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here and for sticking through the entire program. Yes, and for those of you who are students in particular, have some grab-and-go snacks for you to take to the next stop. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Appreciate it. Turn this off. Thank you. I always walk away thinking, what did I just say? I don't even know what I said. You 